So this is the in-hospital uh, uh, device, and this is what it looks like with a patient at home. It's just a very small uh, little desktop, looks like a little bit bigger than an iPad, on a nice stand. And this shows just shows the communication uh, from the, from the, uh, the patient. Uh, get the information gets transmitted to a service center, and the service center has communication with the uh, with the uh, physician and the, and the team. And also, the service center can not only not only um, looks at the values in terms of uh, out of bound values, but also can uh, debug for technical issues. And finally, can also determine compliance of the patient. So they, they can tell if, if obviously if the patient's not uh, making daily readings, they can make contact with the physician and um, and say that this patient is not being compliant um, and, and can check in on the um, can check in on the patient um, through the course of the development of the clinical programs and the. Um, and the other um, uh, uh, commercial aspects of the use of the device. There have been a number of, a very large number of partners that are participating in trials and also using the device on a clinical basis. So today we're, we have two distinguished uh, panelists, Dr. Nir Uriel and Dan Ben Simone from, um, from Chicago and North Carolina, respectively. And uh, we're going to have uh, hear about some of the theory and the, the validation of the correlations between REDS and and uh, other hemodynamic parameters, and then also uh, from Dr. Ben Simone, some very um, interesting data about the, the real-world applications of this in clinical practice. So we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Muri Dr. Uriel giving us a discussion about um, the hemodynamic correlations. So good morning, everybody, and Dan, thank you very, very much. I, I have to say that uh, this is a new concept a little bit, and uh, when we sat down with Amir and his team, uh, he sit down and he said, you're heart failure doctors, what do you believe in? And as a heart failure doctor, we usually tell you people, we believe in pressure. However, what do we treat? We treat volume, we give our patient diuretics. So the challenge that we are facing at heart failure specialists is what is really the measurement that we need to follow when we, pay, we see heart failure patient? And eventually what we want to do treat our patient, that they will have a better quality of life, they will be able to exercise more, they will be less congested, and they will have less pressure. So we have here a unique technology that Dan just uh, presented to us that gives us the ability to assess the fluid content of the chest. However, how this fluid content of the chest correlate with the pressure that we see inside the cardiac chamber, that was a question that we asked ourselves. So in the University of Chicago, uh, we uh, proposed this study, so it's an investigated initial study, and the result that I'm going to show you is a, a study that we performed. We actually took 145 patients, and uh, those 145 patients were all common. Whenever we had a patient that had a clinically indicated uh, to go to the cath lab and to get the right heart cath to assess his hemodynamic, we enrolled those patients in the study. So those patient population can be patients that have advanced heart failure that we evaluated for heart transplantation. They can be someone that is regular heart failure that come to the hospital with decompensated heart failure and the physician feel that this patient needs to be assessed a little bit deeper. Side by side with that, as you know, a lot of the people that visit the cath lab may be people with heart transplantation. And this was a unique opportunity for us because we have we hope that those patients have a normal feeling pressure and they can represent the normal population that we also want to know whether this can identify the normal patient population. So we have 145 patients in a mean age of 55. 70% of them were male. The average BMI was 29. Um, we have a, a patient population that is specifically to the University of Chicago. We see it in the south side of the city of Chicago. And as you can see, we have 36% of the patient Afro-American, 56% Caucasian. Ischemic etiology represents 23% of the patient, and 21% of the patient had AFib. So it's a very classical heart failure population if you want to think about it. And immediately what we did was very, very simple. The patient gets the reds and they get the swan at the same time. So there is no question if there is a delay or anything, getting both tested at the same time. And as you can see here, there was a very clear distinguish between people with normal, we defined four groups. A group of patients that we call them normal, a patient with CVP below 12 and wedge below 18. This is something that Dan and I are working for a long, long time in all the University of Chicago team. 
all our studies focusing on those patient populations said their feeling pressure is okay. We identified a group of patients that had RV failure. So CVP was elevated, but the wedge was below 18. As you can, you can see, both those groups have normal red reading in the range of the 30, 30, 31. However, there was two more challenging groups. One group that had a normal CVP below 12, however, elevated wedge pressure. For all of us who sit in the audience and take care of our fellow patients, it's very clear those are patients that need to be decongested or unload of this left ventricle because there is extra pressure inside of it that's probably coming from extra volume. And this is a discussion that we'll discuss later on, the differentiation between volume. Look what a big jump in the red reading for average of 38 in this patient population. And we had a patient population that contained biventricular failure, the patient that have an elevated CVP above 12 and an elevated wage pressure, people that have congestion in both sides, and those patients actually have even a red that reach 41 degree. So if we take in all of this and put it a little bit, and as you can see, it appears some correlation of this, and put it into perspective, the negative predictive value of a red uh, above 34 is 90.4%. What does it mean? And uh, this is a continuous study that hopefully next year we will be able to uh, provide for you. Whenever uh, we have a clinic that is run, for example, by our APN, and a patient comes in with short breath, and we do the red read. If the red read is below 35, meaning 34 and below, the chance that this patient have a wedge above 18 is really, really low. The negative predictive value is 90%. So that's what we're speaking here. We have a sensitivity of 82%, a specificity of 75%. And we learning now, and that's something that we are also learning, which patient are the patient that really these uh, two elements correlate strongly. However, what I want to emphasize to all of you, that the difference between wedge and volume is not something that we need to take for granted. Meaning, they're going to be patients that have extra volume inside of them, but the fill and pressure are not going to be high. Yesterday, and I'm sorry that we don't have it here, but I will be happy to share, we had a presentation by one of our fellows, fellow Sarah Kalantari. We keep the reds on the patient while he was in the cath lab. And the patient had an elevated wedge and a low cardiac index. As a result, we decided to do in the cath lab inotrope testing. And we give this patient milrinone. We give him the milrinone in, in a dose of 5 microgram per kilogram per minute for 10 minutes, overall 50 mi uh, microgram per kilogram per minute. A very aggressive loading dose of milrinone. This is a test that we do usually. And while this happened, the patient cardiac index improved dramatically. The patient wedge decreased, but surprise, what happened to his reds went up. And why is that? Because we have a pulmonary vasodilator and we suck in the acute phase, we have actually more fluid coming to the lung with reduced pressure. The patient feels better, eventually we'll be able to clean it. So I want to make sure that this is a decoupling that can happen between volume and pressure on the acute setting and something that we need to remember. And this is actually going to what we can see here with the correlation between the red reading and the wedge, we should not expect them to be one-to-one. -one. We should expect to have differences, and we should expect that those two information that we can give from a patient, any kind of MEM technology or whatever, is one thing, volume technology is the other. So in conclusion, lung flow and content measured by reds correlate to invasive measurement of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, However, pressure and volume are different entities, and this is important uh, to understand. We found the I negative predictive value of 90.4%, and uh, we are going to focus on specific group. We are here in the ISHLT, this is a specialty meeting. Uh, tomorrow, more, uh, tomorrow evening, uh, Dr. Gabriel Sayer from our team is going to present a specific patient population on heart transplantation. I don't want to uh, give a spoiler, but uh, the results on heart transplantation give us a lot of clue of how Maybe we can follow heart transplant patient with REDS. And definitely we have a, a presentation on the REDS in regard to LVAT and of course the heart failure as you can see here. So there is a strong correlation. Can it correlate to what happened in the clinical? And I think Dan Ben Simchon uh, is going to share with us their study over there. Dan? Thank you. Good morning everybody, thanks for having me. Um, 
Uh, we run a, a fairly large uh, community hospital heart failure program in Central North Carolina. Uh, we are affiliated with Duke and uh, also do, do a lot of work with uh, Carolina's Medical Center. And our interest in this is how do we manage our patients better? How do we bring this to the point of care and not only help our providers manage patients better, but how do we help hospitals around us? We have three or four hospitals around us that have no heart failure program and really not much clinical buy-in with the physician team about managing their heart failure patients. Uh, and they've come to us and how can you help us uh, manage this population? And they've asked us, can you see these patients in the clinic? How do you do it? And we're trying to extend our reach to these patients, but we're fairly limited. We have two heart failure providers, we see 5,000 visits a year between myself and my partner and our two mid-levels. So we're sort of stretched for resources. So we've tried to apply this technology to a point of care. How can we extend ourselves to do a better job and assist our communities and our patients? So we've been very busy over the past year, year and a half with, uh, with the best. And this is sort of one of the, some of the things we're doing, uh, extending ourselves into various points of care and various networks. Uh, you can see we're using the clinic. We have a clinical trial that's starting on Monday uh, at one of our uh, sister hospitals in Burlington, North Carolina. Uh, we've been using it on discharge. We have a randomized trial, a single center randomized trial. We just enrolled our 105th patient today. We're very happy about that. Uh, we've been using it in nursing homes, uh, and it also can be, can, excuse me, can be used at home. So I want to share with you just for a few minutes, uh, tell you sort of some of the things we've done and, and the experience we got with this technology. Um, uh, our initial experience has been in the clinic. We've had it in the clinic with us um, for a little over six months now, maybe coming up on nine months. And, and what we've done is as patients come into clinic, um, we sort of do a random sampling. We do on demand, but we also sort of do a random sampling of patients. Uh, we've measured about uh, 200 patients. And we've really changed, um, we, we've trained our nurse, uh, nurse assistants, and not our nurses, but trained really our nurse assistants to get this so that our nurses can continue doing what they're doing and then nurse assists can come in and when they're getting the vital signs, they can also uh, put, the, put the device on, the REDS device on. So it's been a very broad patient population. As Dan pointed out, the, the average range of lung volume, uh, lung fluid is 20, 20 to 35%. So anything over 35, we sort of pay attention to between 36 and 39 is sort of this buffer zone. And then over 40 patients really start getting symptomatic. So what you see, is, these are just patients walking into clinic just for their routine visits. 40% uh, of the patients walking into clinic uh, were over 36, 36% are over, and a full quarter of them were over 40%. So uh, at least a quarter of patients coming into our clinic are coming in with significant volume overload just for their routine visits. Um, we compared our assessments. We wanted to see how good we were at predicting uh, what we thought the lung water was and their congestion was. I got 100%, everybody else know. Um, the, the, the average, uh, st Dr. Russell taught me how to do that, so uh, <laughs> I got 100%, and uh, no, but the, we, were, we were right 77% of the time. So 23% of the time, uh, the vest actually improved our diagnostic abilities in this patient population, and it went both ways. Uh, sometimes people were drier than we thought, and we ended up pulling back their diuretics, but most often they were wetter than we thought and we ended up being a little bit more aggressive with their diuretics. And remember, this is a clinic that sees 25 to 30 patients a day, very busy clinic, uh, and we should be pretty adept at it, and yet we are still uh, missing the mark about a quarter of the time. Um, our most recent activity has been a randomized trial that we've been using at the time of discharge. Um, we've been charged, like most of you I'm sure, is to uh, take control of the readmission rates in your hospital. And uh, so we've been very aggressive at trying different strategies, and, one of the thoughts is we see about a quarter of the patients in our hospital, our heart failure team sees about a quarter of the heart failure patients in our hospital. So we see 20 or 25, and the hospitalist team and general cardiologists see the other 100. And so we're wondering, are these patients getting discharged a little too soon? So what we did is a randomized trial designed for 100 patients. We're going to 120 now. Um, but what the trial does is when the, the patient gets admitted, they get diuresis, and when the patient's ready for discharge, um, we then come in and we put a, we put a red uh, vest on them and measure their lung water. In the intervention arm, if you're 39% or greater, you then get a heart failure constant. Um, if you're in the control arm, you get a, uh, you get a reading, it goes into the cloud and you go home. What we're finding is that 32%, now to 32, 32% 32 
of patients are being discharged with a REDS reading of greater than 39%. So there, somebody's looking at that patient and saying, it's time for you to go home. And if you think 35 and under is normal, and these people are at 39, 40, and we had a patient today who was 45%. So the heart failure team comes and sees them. Uh, we then take over the heart failure management. We give them additional diuresis. Uh, the average length of stay, extra length of stay, has been 2.3 days. Um, and the average additional weight loss has been seven pounds with a range of almost up to 20 pounds. Um, we are still, we're gonna, over the next three to six months, uh, we're gonna accumulate some readmission data and sort of figure out whether or not we're affecting readmissions. But one thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, we've been looking for a way to assess who's the high risk patient, who is the patient, even if they don't get readmitted, who's gonna need more services and more things. And if you have 125 patients a month coming to your heart failure for I mean, your hospital for heart failure. Having a, a device like this that says, we keep getting this wrong in this patient, really helps us sub-select out the patients that we want to bring into the heart failure clinic and triage. So it's really been an effective resource for us to not only manage these patients a little bit better uh, in the hospital, but also to be kind of made aware of which patients really need the most help. Um, as I said, we are now uh, partnering with several small hospitals uh, around us. Uh, we have a hospital in Randolph, North Carolina, that has a uh, really no heart failure program, but a very, very engaged uh, nurse program, a home nurse program. So what we did is we gave the home nurses, uh, we gave them a device, and we gave them a protocol. We gave them, if the, if the number is this, do this with Lasix. If the, go out and measure them again tomorrow, if it's still up at Metolazone. We gave them a, a very specific protocol. And what we saw, and we had them follow post-discharge patients, and they did not have physician supervision. Uh, at their site, it was just done with the protocol and using me through text uh, to sort of talk to them about the patients. And what we did uh, on, in that protocol over three months, we took their readmission rate uh, for that population from 23% to 14% uh, in that patient population. Uh, so it's uh, so our initial trial, but the nice thing about this is we never had to see those patients. We never went down there, we never did anything. It was all done through their nurse, home nurse program. Um, uh, on Monday, we are starting uh, a randomized controlled trial uh, at Alamance Regional Hospital in Burlington, Burlington, North Carolina. And the reason we're doing this, if you look um, at their ER, uh, when patients with heart failure come to their ER complaining of shortness of breath, almost 85% of patients who present to the ER in that fashion get admitted. Uh, and there was some pushback from the hospital's team saying, we don't think everybody needs to be admitted, but the ER calls us, we just bring them in. So what we're doing is we're putting, uh, we're putting a device in the ER triage, patients come in complaining of shortness of breath. As part of their initial workup, they get a reading. Uh, if it's 25 to 35, then we suggest perhaps you should look for other causes of dyspnea. If it's 36 to 39, then we say if this is probably mild to moderate heart failure, let's give them one or two doses of IV Lasix and see them back tomorrow in the heart failure clinic, which is adjacent to the ED. Uh, and then if it's greater than 40, then we'd strongly suggest uh, admission. So the hospital's been trained. Uh, this is kicking off on Monday, uh, and the goal is to see if we can decrease um, hospital admissions out of the ER. Uh, finally, we're doing it also. We have uh, two nursing homes in our area uh, that have a high rate of uh, sending patients back to the ER every time they uh, complain. Um, so we've equipped them with uh, vests, and they're using the vests in addition to daily weights uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, to help them monitor fluid status. And they also use it on calls. In the middle of the night, if the patient says, I'm short of breath, they come and put a vest on. And but the nice thing about that is when they call you in the middle of the night, they say, this person's short of breath, you can't, and you have somebody in your ear, you're half awake, trying to figure out what to do with the patient. The easiest thing to do is just send them to the ER. But now they actually give you some actionable data. They say, well, the person's short of breath, and they have a number of 38 kind of makes me feel good. Okay, I know they have a little bit of heart failure, it's not overwhelming, and I, I can control that from home. Uh, so it really makes a, a nice resource in dealing with a nursing home population. Um, so I gotta wrap it up here, but uh, you know, they asked me to come up with a couple of points, and I think uh, the first point is about our heart failure clinic. You know, about 30 to 40 percent of people who come into clinic uh, are volume overloaded. And, uh, uh, and the same thing for people who are being discharged from the hospital. And it's not always easy <clears throat> to, uh, to assess exactly how volume overloaded they are. So this tool has really helped us improve our diagnostic ability, certainly within our clinic. But we're finding that uh, for 
medic uh, for the medical residents, for the hospitalists. This really adds uh, to their uh, the diagnostic abilities and helps them participate better with the heart failure team. Um, uh, then also reaching out to our first second point, it also expands our reach. Uh, we can now give this to home health nurses. We can put a device in the ER, and instead of us having to be there at every point of contact, um, we can empower these people to become a little bit better heart failure physicians and feed us back the data when needed. We can really extend our reach and extend the number of patients we can treat without seeing them personally. Um, and I guess at the end, you know, I think Nir made a very good point. We don't know what's this relationship between uh, pressure and fluid. I will tell you it's very clear when patients cross 40, 41, 42, they start to get uncomfortable. Um, no matter if they have, you know, we had a person in clinic the other day that had a lot of right heart failure, very swollen, but very comfortable, and their REDS reading was 32 or 33. But if you get someone with minimal edema and a REDS reading of 44, that's what's going to drive them to the ER. Not being able to breathe is what's going to drive them to the ER. So for us, this has been very helpful at uh, sort of early prognostication. If we can get them in that 36 to 40 range and treat them and get them back down before they hit 42 or 43, uh, we think we can do a little bit of a better job. Uh, we'll have some data, a little bit more data at HFSA. We'll, we have uh, uh, hopefully the readmission data from our discharge study will be done by then and uh, shed a little bit more light on the finances of it all. So, thanks. Thank you. Great. We have some time for some questions if there are, aren't any. I think um, I'll just start off. Um, that was a really interesting clinical anecdote that you gave that correlated very well with the data near showed about this right, right heart versus left heart. So this is really giving us specific information about lung, about fluid in the lung and not, you know, separating, really able to separate out right and left heart failure. Of course, right heart failure is a little bit easier from the clinical side to, uh, to assess and to, uh, to diagnose. And this really, I think we're learning more and more that left heart, understanding what a patient's wedge pressure is, what a, pressure, what a patient's volume status is, is much harder than we kind of thought clinically and what we were taught to look at veins and, and, uh, and uh, listen, listening with the stethoscope. So, um, and I think that also is important complementary information to results from the ESCAPE trial that were published last year showing that many patients get discharged from the hospital um, in still volume overloaded state and those patients have in that study a much higher rate of readmission. So, uh, Dan, you were really showing a, an interesting application of using this in the hospital to help decide when, um, when patients are maybe in an optimal state for, for discharge. So in addition to those point of care at, um, uh, applications, you've also been using this at home. And so Nir, you've had, you and your team have had some experience sending patients home with this device, and maybe you can just say a few words about that. Yeah, so uh, the SMILE study. The SMILE study, she does that at the PI from our side. So the uh, SMILE study, we have the, uh, like, uh, many other centers in the country. We have patients in, uh, in the small study at home. Uh, patient their ratings have been adjusted based on the reds. Uh, reds. And eventually, uh, you know, it's um, whatever we need is something objective. Where uh, we get all the time phone calls. We are gaining weight, we are not gaining weight. We call to the patient, we change the diuretics. And I have to say, we all know that the weight is really not a good parameter in order to follow patients and to learn how to adjust them. So uh, in order to have another tool that instead of you asking the patient to weight himself to get a, a red read that represents the volume in the chest, and whatever the red, red uh, read is, what we actually look in more is the dynamical changes and not the absolute value. And you know where your patient lives. And you know when your patient lives when you feel well, and you know when your patient feels when you feel not well. And you can adjust that based on it. So there is the nuance is not only the absolute value, the nuance is actually the relative uh, changes of the patient read in regard to that. I think that uh, hopefully in a year or two, the study will be finished and we'll be able to know the result. If, the, if really adjustment, like what we're doing, because Dr. Adate is doing adjustment all the time, and uh, I'm sure that he is a phenomenal clinician, so he's doing well, <laughs> but I want to see this result come to fruition, the patient that actually we are adjusting the diuretic based on the red, have less readmission and even maybe improve survival because now it's the first time, by the way, it was in the last AHA, that people correlate survival with the diuretic use. We never spoke in hotel, we said better blocker reduce mortality, ACRB, the Entresto, Spironolactone. 
it's the first, it was a sub-analysis from the champion that looked at volume and diuretics and correlate to reduce patient volume, correlate with outcome. So uh, we need to make sure that our patients are not congested, and we need to get to their reason. Do you want to add to that, Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think he made, uh, Nir made an important point, and it's a, probably a more clinical point on our end. You know, um, as we uh, switch more people over to Entresto, a lot of these patients come back and say, you know, I just feel better. And I think a lot of that mechanism, I think we both share the feeling that this is decongestion. You know, they get that little extra decongestion, they just feel a bit better. Uh, and I think it's the same way uh, in the discharge. You know, we've had uh, many of these patients say, you know, this is the best I've felt in a long time. And I think for a safety margin, we're used to leaving a little bit of fluid behind just because we're trying to be safe. And we don't always get patients, you know, the average number, the reds number, we get patients down uh, eight points on average. So they start at 44, we'll get them down to 36 on average. But some patients will start at, four, you know, we had one that was at 54, and we got them down to 40 or so. Um, and they felt great. And then, you know, sometimes it's a stage fashion where you get them down. Um, but uh, I think it gives us a little bit more impetus just to push a little harder. And uh, we had another interesting case uh, that we had someone who came in with uh, acute pneumonitis, actually a horrible chest x-ray. They were going to be sent home. And uh, they, uh, they were, you went to see the echo was normal. They were dry. They were in the vest trough. So we went to see it. The guy has acute pneumonitis. And he had lung water surrounding the acute pneumonitis. Set rate of 94. Uh, so ended up getting treated for it. But uh, it's just a powerful tool to look inside. I mean, you have to know how to use it, you have to get comfortable with it, uh, but once you get comfortable with it, the utility of this device clinically is, uh, is pretty amazing. Was there any significant training period for your nurses or your staff to, to use the device? Or it yeah, it's, it's funny, I, I give them a hard time, but uh, they won't, uh, you know, the home health nurses in Randolph got to this, I mean, they were on it, spot on, very, very quickly. Um, we took, uh, there are a couple people in our clinic who took a little extra, a couple extra training sessions, but. Uh, the company came in and helped us train them, and now now they got it. They're sort of um, uh, on autopilot. But uh, and of course, the patients themselves, even the older ones, are able to do this reproducibly. Yeah, I mean, some of the limitations are people with kyphosis, people who are really big. Um, um, uh, you know, it can be a little bit more difficult in some of those patient populations. But over 80 to 90 percent of people, we get it on, and there's just some people we can't. You know, if they have a device right there, you can't do it. So, for the most part, we get 80 to 90 percent. Question. Follow up on uh, Dr. Burkhoff's question. Did you, if you have experience with the cardio meds as well, could you compare and contrast the two systems as far as the burden on your, on your staff, yourself, and person? So uh, we we don't we have uh, of course the cardio meds system in place in the uh, University of Chicago, and we have patients with the cardio meds, and actually they're also in the rest. But uh, when we implant the cardio meds. Uh, we do it uh, in same implantation session, we do a full right heart catheterization because you do the calibration of the cardiomans based on right heart cath. So actually the number that you, you saw here, the correlation, is, is the same because the right heart cath calibrate the cardiomans that then we did the correlation with the, uh, the, the reds. We have five patients, we have five patients that currently have reds reading and, car and are on the cardiomans uh, follow up. As an outpatient, we didn't brought them back, we can do it, and uh, it will be interesting. But uh, again, uh, for us, the gold standard is still the PA pressure that measure in the, um, in the cath lab, in the right heart cath lab, and we feel very comfortable with them to correlate them. But uh, five, five of the patients, of those 145, have already caught them in place, so we can continue to follow. So let me just say one thing to that. So. Um, we too have done a lot of cardi mems, um, and we also have a lot of optoball and core view and things like that. Um, so we haven't um, we haven't correlated directly with cardi mems, but we have done it with the other devices, um, and we um, we haven't done it in a, in a, in a systematic fashion. But uh, you know, there's a subgroup of patients for whatever reason their their optoball goes up and it just stays up and it never comes down. For I think for the most part, for a good percentage of these patients, it correlates. Uh, but it's very helpful when the optimal is sky high and you look at the patient and you say, it just doesn't, this just doesn't mean anything. So we found it to be um, uh, more helpful than optimal. But, you know, the thing for me is, um, you know, this is on the fly. I can do it anywhere. Um, and, you know, getting somebody in the clinic, putting a device, getting into the cath lab, putting a device in, you know, it's one device, one patient. 
And we have one device now, a thousand patients. So we have five devices in our clinic. We have five, you know, over 3,000 patients, 5,000 visits. And now we're servicing three or four other hospitals. So the utility of it for us is one device, many patients. And that's where, for us, it makes much more clinical sense and financial sense uh, to use a point of care device like this rather than putting a device in every single person. Uh, yes, hi, Patrick Berta with Edwards. Uh, I was wondering if you saw, and that's a question for Uri, any uh, correlation with heart valve disease, in particular mitral regurg, V waves, and impact of that on the right reading? So, near, Uli is my research partner, <laughs> it's okay. And uh, um, it's a very, very good question. And actually, we look at it in specifically to the V wave. So actually, when you, when you look at hemodynamic, we, what we saw here is really simplification of the study because uh, we didn't want to go to detail. And you're right. A wedge pressure can be very simple to measure when you don't have mitral regurgitation, when we don't have left atrial that is actually non-compliance, for example. But if you do them, if you have a bad left atrium, if you have a mitral regurgitation, you're going to have a big V-wave. And this V-wave, what actually is the real wedge? Is the wedge the, a, the mean of the A-wave of the waveform, or is it actually the V-wave that you see on the top? And then and I had a long, long discussion to choose. The result that you see here is the mean of the A wave of the wedge form. We, uh, by purpose, and the three people that do, because we had three people have to read the right heart cath to be a uh, concomitant, Dr. Jin Kim, Dr. Gabriel Sir, and Dr. Chiutazadatia read those right heart cath, and the people that have a, a tall V wave, we are looking at them specifically. And your question and, uh, 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 is uh, well done, because mitral regurgitation patient may have a, a tall V wave, it doesn't mean that they have a lot of volume. This is a compliance, this is a pressure story, this is not always a volume story. And that's the reason in the hardcore analysis, the basic analysis, we are doing a mean of the A wave, but to your specific question, patient with mitral augmentation, patient with bed left out your compliance, that have a tall V wave, we will need to present both of them separately in order to give you, the more sophisticated clinician, a tool that may be actually in helping us. You know, for me, it's always a challenge when I see a patient. Is it a volume story or is it pressure? Am I giving more afterload? Am I giving more diuretics? And this is exactly the answer that you can get from those, to adjusting those tools together. If it's, for example, an, a V-wave that is to the roof, you're going to give much more afterload reduction. Maybe you will be helping the patient more. On the contrary, if it's a mean A that is elevated, you're going to do that. And that, that's the reason that we correlate it with the mean A, with the volume. Okay, any other um, questions or comments from anyone? If not, um, thank you very much for attending and thank you Dr. Uriel, Dr. Ben Simone for a very nice discussion.